Everyone hear me all right? Awesome. Yeah, it's um, really good to have discussions with so many of you already, and it's good to see um, a lot of people come out to, uh, to hear me talk about this. Um, how many of you have heard of Have I Been Pwned Before? Um, I guess a few. Awesome. Um, and Pwned Passwords? Uh, um, I guess, yeah. Awesome. So, um, when I, yeah, um, I definitely already got a lot of questions from this audience, which is great because um, uh, normally when I talk about this topic, it's, um, um, I'll give a slightly different uh, talk, but this time what I'm going to do is I've got, I'm going into a lot of things which I haven't spoken about before, um, about pwned passwords, and I'm going to also tell the overarching story about how this achieved kind of widespread um, adoption um, and um, that kind of story for anyone who's kind of thinking about building something similar and is wanting to put something into the uh, public domain. So um, I'll start off with a bit about kind of um, how I got into this. So years and years ago, um, basically I kind of um, left school when I was about 16. I did an apprenticeship, which is you work about 20% of the, or you work 80% of the time, study 20% of the time. And I'd already had kind of a model about, um, a long think about password authentication and things like that. And um, the first time authentication attacks really hit me was actually um, when I was um, in that job, the CRM system stored passwords basically in plain text. I raised this to my manager at the time and he said to me, oh, could you actually show me a, real attack of how that, that's useful. And it just so happened there was someone um, who I was able to ask, can I log into a popular site for you? Um, and lo and behold, they were reusing the password, basically. And that's um, one of the earlier times. Um, I worked at a lot of digital agencies. I then went into high integrity engineering. And at Cloudflare, kind of the time became right to work um, you know, we'd gained traction, the Ashley Madison stuff had come out, this was a clear issue. There's some work Troy Hunt had done, and this stuff kind of became more and more relevant. So, in essence, um, kitten slash puppy raw slide. So, this is a really cool um, site, if, um, and if you know about it, HTTP cat. You can put a HTTP status code in the end, and you get a um, image. But yeah, I'm going to talk on three kind of levels here. I'm going to talk about Pwned Passwords itself. I'm going to talk about EVE Online, which is an implementation of how it worked in practice. And then I'm going to talk about authentication attacks at scale. Um, and um, I'll leave you guessing as to what that is for now. So let's continue. <laughs> So, um, why haven't passwords been replaced? This is quite a paper from a little while ago now, which talks about um, replacements for passwords. Interestingly, this paper does also compare email-based one-time password, um, so-called passwordless kind of logins and stuff like that. And the quote from here is, you know, no, um, no scheme um, comes close to providing all the benefits that passwords have. Um, it's quite an interesting paper there, but passwords are going to be here for a long enough time. Humans aren't always security conscious. They don't always follow best practice, um, as you can see there. And I've had to censor out some of the words here, but kind of in the beginning, um, you know, we used to think of things in terms of dictionary attacks, the dictionary of a lot of passwords, um, you know, and you're able to crack hashes that way using... Um, common um, your uh, passwords to to break them. So, um, in order to counter this, kind of one of the things the industry came up with was password requirements. Um, you know, um, absurd kind of levels of complexity for users here. Um, and in essence, they did not re um, you know they did not reduce the amount of meaningful information in passwords. You know. Or, password recycling, things like that. Um, so um, that's kind of where we thought we were at this point. It's like, okay, this is, this is fine. <laughs> and then we come to credential stuffing. Credential stuffing. 
a website is hacked to disclose usernames or passwords. This can either be data breaches, you know, large-scale data breaches. You can, you know, download files of, um, of databases with username and password combinations. You can then input them into other s sites. I put secure here, but, you know, regardless of whether they're secure or not. Um, and then where a password is reused user accounts are compromised. An interesting version of this is not only from the data breach perspective, but also thinking on the basis of brute force attacks on you know, um, websites which aren't as security hardened. So for example, you, know, you breach a forum and then you're able to escalate that up to, up to a bank or something like that. Um, so this is definitely not fine. <laughs> And um, this is where we turn to kind of pwned passwords and the role um, that plays. So we know password composition rules are ineffective. Instead, ideally, we want to block users from signing up with breached passwords. Research indicates users change their behavior upon fear appeals. Um, this research was actually even established before pwned passwords came out. And um, the NIST guidance as well recommends this. Um, there's, there's some really interesting stuff which started to come out um, right um, before the release of this where standardization was more driving towards this behavior as well. And there was a certain set of problems here um, originally. Um, the original Pwned Passwords API um, you know, had a, a, a very large password list in the hundreds of millions. Um, you know, site owners didn't particularly want to download an entire database, and they didn't want to send an unsalted hash to have I been pwned. Um, so this is calendar invite a while ago, pwned passwords v2 go live from Troy. And this was February the 21st. And this is really what I'm going to talk you through the story of um, Pwned Passwords and how that, that came out. Um, so Pwned Passwords version 2 implemented, it was a bigger um, data breach, or not big data breach, but a bigger um, list of um, hashes, but also included an anonymity model I worked on. This anonymity model, um, there's a Cloudflare blog post which was simultaneously released with it, which explains some of the detail in how that works. It's been in a lot of places. This is quite a cool YouTube channel called Computer File. They actually explain um, a lot about how this works there. Um, it got a lot of press attention. Immediately, a lot of people implemented it. One password I hear their engineers had uh, sleepless nights as they were so keen to implement it. It found its way into Firefox for their account Ponage Probe. Okta implemented it. Um, and later on, Google actually began to roll this out. And this is something which is quite interesting. It turned out, in many respects, the original work itself, it was a combination of different efforts. There was some academic work, which um, I'll show which fed into this. There was also some, um, some of the, the work from my side and Cloudflare in terms of getting it publicized, but really teaming up with Troy gave it a lot of velocity, and we were able to combine efforts there. Um, effectively, the original problem was you basically bucketed hashes together. In effect, um, I'll explain how a query works in a second, but you would l um, limit the amount of data which is shared with a third party when you're querying the pwned passwords service. The kind of bucketing uh, pseudocode is kind of described there. Basically, um, it finds a bucket size by truncating the hash until you find a point at which um, no bucket is empty, effectively. So that we found this to be five characters in the pwned passwords data. So a search example is quite straightforward, and this was actually really critical for us. It made it very, very easy for developers to adopt. It made it very easy for them to implement, and this drove adoption as well. So in essence, you take a SHA-1 hash of the password, and you know, when we think about hashing passwords normally, if we're using key derivation function, you know, we will have a salt, we'll keep injecting that salt in, rehashing for a desired amount of difficulty. Um, this kind of does the inverse. It truncates it to create ambiguity, 
and then it makes a request, um, and it gets a response with all the suffixes of that hash, and it can check if it is breached effectively. So, you know, here's a simple enough curl request, um, api.pwnpasswords.com slash range, and um, five hexadecimal characters. The starting bit is the hash suffix there, then there's a colon, and the count of how often the password is used. So you can see test appearing quite a lot there. Then the academic side, this was quite good. As this got more and more publicity, um, I teamed up with Cornell um, University who wanted to do a lot more research into this and were able to drive the protocols even further forward. And hopefully a lot of this stuff will end up being rolled into, um, into have I been pwned uh, soon enough. There's two types of, um, of protocol here. There's one where you just check the password. Um, the, it's got have I been pwned there, and it's got um, frequency, um, size dis, um, frequently, uh, frequency size bucketization, and that's basically where, um, or frequency smoothing bucketization, sorry, where basically you even out the distribution of password reuse, and then you've got the combination of username and password there, where Google implemented with Google Password Checker, and another protocol we have there, um, IDB. IDB effectively works by you query on the prefix being like the email um, instead, and then you get the um, um, list of passwords there, and there's some empirical kind of uh, data around how that, that works there. The other element of this was getting this to perform really, really well, um, and getting it to be fast um, around the world, and um, this came down to cache hit ratio. Um, so, pwned passwords is behind Cloudflare. Um, this was, oops, excuse me. This was from uh, June 2018, and um, basically you can see, you know, the cache hit ratio was driving upwards. Someone's asking, you know, will my secret ways ever be released? So you'll get to hear about the secret ways now. Um, but yeah, um, over time, this kind of went upwards to 98% cache hit ratio, so it would never have to go to Troy's kind of Azure serverless backend. They're all able to be a good one. Uh, edge. The other benefit, traffic spikes was a good one. Um, you know, um, in effect, um, you don't have that problem. HTTP 429, too many requests, because, um, because Cloudflare is able to take the load there. Um, and in effect, um, the reason this was complicated on Pwn passwords is there uh, 16 to the power 5 buckets in total. Um, so on a simple site like Troy's got here, you can get quite a high cache hit rate. And um, another problem here is, I'm not sure if you've noticed, if you're implementing Pwn passwords, in fact, if you're pulling in a JavaScript library, um, into your site from a remote origin, and it has to do like, um, or if it's a JavaScript sub-request, it has to use cores, um, and cores sends another header, and that header's the origin header to say where the request is coming from. In order not to break cores, Cloudflare's default cache key looks something like this. So it has, you know, towards the end, you've got you know, the scheme, the host header, the URI, but before that, you also have the origin header. And um, that's in order to not break cores if people want to treat different origins differently. And basically, in effect, um, this origin header was taken out. We also, um, I also rolled this out on another CDN, which uses Cloudflare. We got a uh, big drive there in cache hit ratio um, as well. Over time, it got to over 99%. Um, the other thing which um, in order to optimize this, Cloudflare has a product called Workers. It's JavaScript at the edge. In effect, I won't expect you to read this all, but this is kind of the logic which sits behind it. There's some stuff at the top for cores. Check it's HTTPS. Checking the query is valid, so it removes the range component and checks the prefix is five characters um, and checks it's valid hexadecimal. The bit at the bottom basically makes sure it goes into cache with that cache key and avoids caching anything which is in a status code of 300 to 599, so avoid any errors being cached there. 
So in effect, um, there's few other bits with pwned passwords. We heavily use things like tiered caching, but that's, that really helped optimize it, and that really helped drive adoption in terms of um, getting pwned passwords into that environment. Um, the other things which kind of worked um, alongside us there was um, we got a lot of press coverage. There's a lot of drive to implement it. And um, really, everything kind of um, worked together in order for us to drive, um, drive adoption of this. So a kind of actual case study of EVE Online, um, which implemented this earlier on. There's a lot of implementations of pwned passwords. But uh, as a guy from EVE Online, Stefan, was lucky enough to share data with us as to how, how this worked in, in um, production. So, 30 days post rollout, 184% increase in password changes, 45% increase in 2FA enablement. After that, you know, it was still sustained. It was still, you know, more than double 117% increase um, and 21% increase in 2FA enablement. This was by fear appeals from people who were logging in. Interestingly, kind of, um, so you can see that hit security graph when that kind of, Spikes, that's when they rolled it out to, to more users. There's various spikes as certain users um, started logging in. And um, a year kind of later after this, um, they basically dr significantly drove down um, the problem of password reuse on EVE Online. They were able to educate their users more. They were able to warn them with fear appeals. Um, other kind of utilities have integrated this in such a way where you cannot set a breached password at all, or if you can, it's beyond, uh, you know, they set a certain amount of, you know, the most common ones um, can't be reused. Um, so, yeah. Um, the other thing um, I want to talk about is kind of credential stuffing in aggregate. So I spoke about credential stuffing towards the start, and this is something kind of new, which... I haven't really spoken too much about before. Um, but credential stuffing, yesterday I was kind of discussing with um, some of you, I asked you, how, um, how common do you think credential stuffing attacks are? Or what's their success rate specifically? And I kind of got a wide range of answers um, from 0.1% to 10%. And... Um, if we take a really basic example of the WordPress authentication model. So for those of you who don't know, the way WordPress logs users in is you make a post request to a PHP endpoint, wp-login.php. If it is successful, it will redirect you to WP admin. It will issue you a 302, else it will issue you a 200, asking, you know, prompting the user to attempt to log in again. There are some other things you need to do, like you need to make sure, get there's certain get parameters if you want to do a password reset, so you have to make sure you exclude um, those types of things. But in order to look at credential stuffing attacks, kind of across the Cloudflare network in aggregate, we purely looked at HTTP headers, and we looked at HTTP uh, post requests to this WP login endpoint. And for the most sophisticated attackers, um, from May to mid-July this year, we took the uh, 500 most active IPs across the Cloudflare network. So Cloudflare network does a lot of traffic. Um, you know, um, at the time, 16 million, out, 16 million active internet properties. Um, and now it's you know, more than 20 million. So we got seven weeks of data. It was aggregated and um, anonymized data, basically, um, no... Um, body information for privacy purposes, so we don't actually know the credentials which were being looked at. And then we defined some metrics for evaluating things in aggregate. So this metric here is something we call the variety ratio. The variety ratio is effectively HTTP responses of 200 uh, OK responses, where you know, someone's prompted to log in um, um, again if they failed, 302s, redirects over the entire set of HTTP status codes. The reason this is interesting is 403s can indicate blocking, 429s can indicate rate limiting. It indicates the origin acting abnormally in some form. To find a success rate as well, the success rate here is 302s over 200s, 
add 302s. Um, to reduce data pollution, so this was interesting as well. When you're looking at WordPress credential stuffing attacks, there are a lot of script kiddies, let's call them that. Um, and they are basically, um, you know, doing these, um, uh, um, trying to, to attack these sites. They often have very low success ratio. Um, so we set a requirement, 47 requests per IP. Um, and, you know, it's 0 to 0.1% 0 type success rate. But we're just looking at, we're, we're just excluding, um, you know, the the least common IPs. Um, so that's, um, and the other thing I should mention about this data is it's collected from um, a very restricted sample of data. It's not across the, um, it's sampled from the network, basically, so it's not an entire set. Um, and unsuccessful attackers, you've got, you know, 10.7% had a user agent of WP scan, version 3.5.3. 2.7% had no user agents. Um, and there's also an interesting thing there with bad referral concatenation, which is something you see quite a lot, these types of attacks. You know, basically, <coughs> requests will make a double slash to that endpoint. So slash slash wplogin.php, that's where they'll, they'll make the post request to. Um, that's interesting in a lot of different ways as well. It can also be interesting if you have an Nginx or Apache configuration. So I think in, I can't remember the exact rules, but I think Nginx defaults to having a, um, there's an argument to join slashes, and then in Apache as well, there is one of the kind of mod rewrite rules um, can certainly not do this as well. So it's interesting in certain configurations, this can actually bypass certain levels of crude security which people end up putting on um, on their sites. So non-zero success rate data. Um, so this is to focus in on the sophisticated attacks. So we were able to um, yep, reduce the sample rate there, and we also required one successful request and one failed request um, for that. So if you look at this chart here, you've got two charts. On the left, you've got unique zones um, along the x-axis, and along the y-axis, you've got success rate. Um, and you can see some clusters appear there in two dimensions. On the right, you can see variety ratio and success ratio. Um, uh, you know, you can see some clusters there in two dimensions. And remember, these are the most sophisticated attackers across the network. So if we look at this in 3D, and we apply some um, buzzword, machine learning, clusterization. Um, Bingo. There we are. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> so one of these three aggregate properties, um, it's interesting. You're able to actually fingerprint attacks quite well. So most successful cluster there, cluster one, the success ratio was 30.5%. The other two clusters, um, I think one had the median success rate was, um, I think um, it was 3%, the other was 3.05%, uh, the other was 3.5%. Um, and but with this cluster, what you also see is you see a lot of requests from the same user agent and a lot from the same country. Interestingly, with the other clusters, it um, the picture changes, but you can actually correlate these attacks together if you if you look closely enough, but this provides an interesting aggregate way of fingerprinting these attacks. And the terrifying thing is, this particular attacker is able to achieve 30.5% success rate. Summary of the clusters there, oh, it's off on my metrics, so median, um, so um, third from the bottom, um, that's kind of the um, mean success rate. Second from the bottom is median. So, um, yeah, um, you basically have cluster one there, which is 30% um, log there. There's cluster zero is 3.55%. Oh, cluster two, 2.27%. Um, interesting. So, IPs, obviously, IP addresses. You've got ASNs there, autonomous systems, you know, networks on the internet, the amount of zones they attacked the sampled um, amount of requests, and the amount of requests per IP launching these attacks, because they are often distributed. Um, I have an
There are additional metrics you can use on this, um, which um, I haven't applied here. There's some other things which, for example, you know, you've got success ratio against the number of IPs. The other interesting thing is a post, oh, excuse me, the post ratio, which is the ratio of post requests to get requests. And you kind of see the clusterization there as well. So, for example, if someone per site is effectively you know, they're, they're basically getting the initial login page first. Um, they should be around, you know, around a 50% mark. That's kind of cluster two on chart you see on the bottom right. Cluster one, you see basically they are effectively making more post requests than get requests. And on the other extreme, you see cluster zero as well. This is an interesting evasion technique. And, um, some of this data, if you want to stay uh, tuned on this, I'll probably tweet out when the paper is out for, um, um, for, this, um, for this research. But in effect, um, it basically um, includes a lot of the methodologies used here. So this is interesting in one sense, because a lot of the stuff I end up doing in a lot of my core work at Cloudflare around security we do end up looking at data in aggregate because in aggregate you can tell a very, very different story and things become very, very hard to spoof as well. So when you talk about entropy metrics and things like that, usually attackers won't be able to get fine-grained metrics on that, even if they can you know, spoof a browser very, very well. So it ties in with some of the talks we've already heard um, earlier on about things like, um, you know, um, you know, a, th a threat-based authentication. Um, this kind of modeling helps us make this kind of more intelligent. So um, I've been trying to be careful of time uh, in case any of you guys um, want to ask questions. The thing I will conclude on uh, before I go into credits is there were three kind of learnings I took away from this. The first one is in order to achieve scale on this, it couldn't have just been a single, um, it couldn't have been an achievement um, on my own. It was about getting people to buy into this vision, you know, Troy getting people in academia to buy in, getting people um, outside, getting the broader adoption um, with protocol was incredibly simple to implement. Now we can start iterating on that. And with a second point, um, I was warned, uh, Per warned me um, to say, at Passwords Con, you should never, um, you should never stuff in absolutes. And in many ways, a lot of the stuff we originally did here was trying to get stuff into the field so it could be tested, because credential stuffing, as we've seen, is a very, very substantial problem. And um, we needed to have some things in there. The, um, the analogy I use, I mean, the protocols held up quite well, and we've managed to iterate on it, and new versions will be coming out. But if you look at SSL, so, you know, the browser padlock, um, now the TLS protocol, SSL version 2, I think it was, like, crack, um, it was broken in, like, half an hour after it was announced by someone in the audience. Um, but because it got there, we got to a state now where, you know, encryption is, um, is widespread, on websites, and kind of the similar model was followed here um, with, with iteration. So one example of this um, I'll just briefly mention is, before we did this, the research on a problem called private set intersection, which was as close as problem there was to this. Private set intersection was basically two people have secret data, and they want to know if their data kind of overlaps. So similar to, to um, this problem, the communication overhead of that was more than downloading the entire data set. And because of that, um, you know, that acted as a barrier, but because we introduced the care anonymity model, because we were able to get researchers involved, because we were able to drive this forward in the industry, we were able to significantly, re um, you know, impact, reduce real user, um, um, experience real user and really protect people and credential attacks can be quite devastating and people were able to iterate on something which wasn't particularly um, kind of thought of before. 
Third thing I'll leave you with is kind of on the analysis front. Um, a lot of the kind of work we see in credential stuffing at the moment, um, I'm lucky in Cloudflare that we have such a wide range of data we can look at. But um, a lot of the data around credential atta stuffing attacks hasn't been shared. Like in academia, in academic material, there is still a very restricted set of information on, um, on the success rate of credential stuffing attacks across the board. This is kind of data we need to get out and we need to share more often, especially because at Cloudflare, you know, you know, privacy factors, we can't look into data in too much detail, but maybe easier in your company if you have some form of platform. So I think that's particularly important as we try and mitigate these types of attacks. And yeah, um, to people who helped on this, so, uh, Troy Hunt obviously po uh, uh, put out, have I been pwned, pwned passwords version one, and he trusted this to go into pwned passwords version two. The researchers from Cornell, um, Rahul, Lucy, uh, Bajita, Thomas Riston part, they um, helped drive a lot of the standardization efforts. Some of my colleagues in Cloudflare, research scientist on the team um, I manage, um, Gosha, she really drove a lot of the, um, the, the research you saw at the end. Nick Sullivan helped drive a lot of the protocol standardization. Stefan sharing the data in C, um, CCP games so we could see real um, user impact and many other academic and product contributions, Google, Stanford, 1Password, Okta, Firefox. So it's been really awesome to be able to drive this. And um, if, uh, yeah, if any of you have got any questions which you didn't ask me yesterday, I'll be happy to take them. <laughs> Thank you.